Hi, Clutter Fairy fans. This is the Clutter Fairy Weekly for September 26th, 2023. I'm your co-host, Ed Gumnick, and I'm speaking with Gail Goddard, certified professional organizer and owner of the Clutter Fairy in Houston, Texas. Hi, everybody. The Clutter Fairy Weekly is the webcast and podcast that digs deep into the clutter that piles up between you and the life that you want to be living. We explore the habits and behaviors that lead to clutter, and we suggest strategies to slow the accumulation, reduce the collection, and comfortably manage the stuff we decide to keep. If you're new to our Zoom meeting, we want to let you know that you can share your comments and questions via the chat feature, and I'll try to make sure Gail addresses them before we move on to another topic. You can also use the raise hand feature if you'd like to ask a question or make a comment yourself via audio or video. And we are also streaming the webcast live on Facebook, so you can share your questions and comments there, and I'll relay them to Gail. We're going to start by talking about last week's weekly tittle, which was called Creative Playtime. The assignment was to dedicate some time to practicing a hobby, art form, or craft that you enjoy. We really, we gave you just such such an easy one this week. Um, <laughs> We want to hear from our participants in Zoom and on Facebook. Who filled our prescription for fun time this week? Please let us know in the comments. I we were actually, not having fun. <laughs> we were doing something else. I was having I was having some fun, but I was also I've also been crazy busy with work. But I have done some craft stuff. I I did I did the uh, I followed the letter and spirit of the law right of okay so law. you got but you got a show right so okay i will show i have to uh unspotlight you and yes yes put yourself back on i'll spotlight me when i get something here so i went back to to one that i haven't been happy with and mostly because i don't like the photo that the client gave me but i'm going to manage anyway so i worked on that this that is a cute little dog <laughs> look Zelda. how cute that is Zelda. It's, it's a terrible photograph, but I, I was working from a terrible photograph, but I'm doing the best I can with it. And uh, I also worked on really just test driving a new set of colored pencils I got that my sister found at a garage sale. Isn't that cool? I just love that abstract. You showed me that earlier. I love that Re so much. Really good Prismacolor colored pencils that are fun to work with they're kind of they're a little waxier than some of the others i have yeah right and, right uh, how about cool. you did you have did you have any time at, at all so um the time that we spent at the board meeting was work 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 but we always have a good time doing it even though it kind of melts our brain a little bit to be working on the stuff that we're doing but um we we usually laugh a lot afterwards and have a great time while we're doing it so it was a you know work slash fun thing for me uh tammy says i painted a lady pumpkin with watercolors oh woohoo there you go oh here's here's Seasonal. a sad here's a sad tale m says i tried to finish beading a necklace that involves some organizing to get all the bead stuff together the necklace did not get finished because i am three beads short to finish <laughs> the pattern isn't that the worst that's just the worst <laughs> So you may have to like add something into the necklace to help, you know, fill it out. If you don't think you can find those beads. You can um, always put your hands on more of them later. Catastrophe said I ordered some 2.6 millimeter colored lead mechanical pencils. They look like regular wooden, wooden, one, wooden ones. Um, I haven't seen colored mechanical pencils. That's kind of cool. I know, right? Me neither. That must be um, fun. Adrienne says, I've spent some time taking a genealogy class in DNA with more to come. Oh, good. That's excellent. A Diane says, I made quilted kitties for a garland. Oh, that's nice. so wonderful. Good job. You guys are being creative. And let's see. Uh, this is not a tittle report, but Paula reports consignment update. I got store credit for the clothing the store took, but the process wasn't worth the time and effort to repeat. I'll just donate in the future. There's a, there's a message we need to broadcast loud and clear. <laughs> right. Right. I mean, I, and, and I mean, yeah, there is stuff that has some, has some value in consignment, but it seems like, I mean, what would you say the percentage is based on your experience, Gail, how much stuff does, do they pay good money for in consignment 
out of yeah all the stuff people have to offload such a little sliver two percent three percent five percent maybe depending on what kind of a shop you are and how long it's been since you bought it like if you're trying to resell last season's most current fashions then yeah you might get a little bit more money than um you know these are things that you had 25 years ago and now you're trying to sell them and so um it's definitely it's definitely a really really small percentage Unless of that making it happen a rare category of stuff some that kind of you know, vintage come, or come back in as a trend and you've got some that's in really good shape um, Paul also yeah. says on the plus side, I'm ruthlessly going through the kitchen and tossing items left and right. Yay. Good job. I'm proud uh, of you. Suzanne said, if you were my neighbor, Ed, if you were my neighbor, I would make you a great lasagna to have an Ed artwork of my dog. Oh, <laughs> I don't know why I haven't thought about trading art for, for food. food. That is a great <laughs> idea. <laughs> I've I've gotten I, I like it. <laughs> so far I've been paid in a little bit of cash and uh wine. Wine, wine is good. All right, all right. Yeah, yeah, but you know, tapping into all the creative uh, cooks around you might be a, a beneficial thing to do. Teresa says I hosted a diaper need drive on Saturday for the Houston Diaper Bank. It was Oh, fun that's cool. I, so fun and I met some new friends. That's really cool. How much fun. Good for you. That's very, that sounds like a very social, um, you know, crafty, fun thing that you did. Um, M went on to say about the beads. The mm -hmm. beads I need aren't made anymore. Oh, there as, you go. So far as I could learn, I thought of taking the entire thing apart and putting clear seed beads between all other beads. Lost interest because I like the pattern as it is. That's a toughie. So then um, one of the things you can do is if if you don't want it to be if the, if the beads that are missing, like you can balance it out by if you're short, three short on one side, you can take the other three off of the other side and, you know, add chain at the end or do something else at the end to keep the pattern, most of the pattern, and then make the shortfall happen in the neck part, you know, where it's going to be attached. Um, and, and then if you needed those extra beads to make the necklace the length that you want, then you can add in, you know, a chain or some other you know, a string of seed beads at that end to extend it to the length that you want and still keep the pattern. Now you may have to unstring and restring if you're going to, you, you want to take beads off and start with something else at the back end, but you can still keep the pattern that way. Sorry, doing a little beady consulting on the side. <laughs> well, well, while we're still on the topic of crafts, <laughs> how's that for a segue? Good job. We mm. would like to address a point that we didn't have time to cover as thoroughly as we would have liked in our last episode which was about organizing art hobby and craft supplies and we also want to respond to a viewer comment that was on the topic yep so in response to our last survey elizabeth asked can you talk about craft supply hoarding several craft friends shop a lot at stores for every type of craft scrapbooking card making stamping knitting crocheting painting etc and this seems like a serious issue but Googling craft supply hoarder generates a lot of cutesy things along the lines of the problem isn't too many craft supplies, it's too small a space. <laughs> right. That is true. That is true. If you, <laughs> when, I have, when I have been searching on that topic, I get lots of little plaque, you know, Etsy plaques. Memes, and yes. Memes and things you can stick on the wall of your craft room, poking fun at yourself for how much stuff you have. But it's yep. a serious topic. Mm, it is. And YouTube viewer RT Antics wrote, my trouble is that I do drawing, collage, monoprinting, markers, watercolor, acrylic, oil, alcohol ink, card making, journaling, writing, jewelry making, etc. I don't I don't even want to think about what etc. implies <laughs> in, right? in a two and a half square meter room. If I'm having a creative spurt, it's chaos. I can't have all my stuff in view as it would be too much simulation for my, my autistic brain. I don't agree about separating supplies by type of craft because I simply don't have the space to do that. I have to have macro categories like craft, collage, and art papers, but I just don't have space to separate crafts further down. 
I also don't have separate work surfaces for wet and dry, so I have to clean up and reset before starting a new project. You called me out about the UFOs. My tray pile is so tall, it may avalanche off the side of my desk. <laughs> so, uh, Elizabeth, I can absolutely talk about craft supply hoarding. Uh, my friends and I laughed about the fact that buying craft supplies is a separate hobby from using craft supplies. Uh, sometimes we make time for the shopping without making time for the doing. And there is something satisfying about finding a variety of supplies and tools related to the art form that you're into doing. When we're captured by an art form or a technique and it, it inspires us to be creative, we all want to build up our collection of supplies to the point that we can truly go any direction with our inspiration. The result of that desire is that we try to build an art store inside of our houses. We shop while thinking everything is a possibility. Truly, we're only limited by our shopping time and our credit limits on our credit cards. The intersection of being inspired by an art form, finding art supplies that we don't have at home yet, and still having credit card capacity is a recipe for drowning in supplies. Shopping's the easy part, no matter what we're shopping for. It's much easier to buy ingredients for a recipe than it is to cook the recipe. And the same is true for art supplies. It's easier to buy supplies than to use them. If you don't interrupt that shopping compulsion with some actual crafting time to use the stuff you have, you will find yourself standing in front of an overstuffed, overflowing studio that you cannot bear to walk into, much left craft in. Scheduling craft time with your friends to work on projects together uses your supplies and keeps you from buying. So it's time to plan some fun with your friends other than shopping. I know everybody likes to go shopping together, but you can craft together instead. Your crafty buddies will be the worst about encouraging you to buy something. Um, better that you hang out and be creative together than together in a store. I speak from experience. My beady friends can talk me right over the cliff when it comes to buying beads. At least now we've all got so many beads in each of our studios that we can't justify buying big piles anymore. We can shop each other's stores instead when we need something. And we make an effort to get together to work on something as a group often via Zoom or in person. So crafty hoarding, crafty supply hoarding is a problem. Um, drowning in the craft supplies uh, shuts down your ability to have fun. And it's better to get together with your friends and use the supplies than it is to go shopping for more supplies. <laughs> That's the better solution. And we just wanted to give Elizabeth a little time to talk about that. And and I have to say, I have to say one more thing. Um, Artie Antics is, um, she's describing the person, the artist who is into many, many crafts all at once. And <clears throat> We all have big, we all have big supplies if we can handle it, if we can afford it, if we can um, spend time to acquire it. But if you're into more than one art form, then you are going to be managing a much more difficult, chaotic collection of stuff than if you're like, all my stuff is about beads and not really about anything else. And so it makes it easier for me to manage, even though the volume is probably the same. I have too much stuff. <laughs> even though the volume is the same, it's easier for me to manage because it's all about beads. She's talking about so many different kinds of crafts and the supplies for all of those different kinds of um, work. And so it's going to be a much harder management task for her to keep up and switch from one craft to the other as she's inspired to jump around. It means that managing and putting away the old, the, the one that you just completed, the art form that you were just in, if you were just doing, you know, card making, then you need to put the card making stuff up before you jump in to try to do the alcohol ink or something. So it's, it's, it makes cleaning up between switching much more important for you to be able to manage and then find supplies again when you want to circle back to card making. So um, those of you that are into multiple disciplines, you have a you have to put a little bit more effort into maintaining your large wall of supplies because it's going to really impede you if you can't find the stuff that goes with that particular craft that day. It's just putting it out there. <laughs> okay. That's what Lorraine, we wanted to say. Lorraine says, the older I get, the less time I feel like doing all those different crafts. Mm. 
and and you try things out and you find that some of them are really inspiring to you and others are not as inspiring to you right like we the whole part of being an artist and being creative and crafty is that it you get interested you get inspired something captures your attention but it may not hold your attention for forever or you try it and you don't like it as much as you thought you would or it turns out to be that there's some portion of it that annoys you right and so you can get to the place where it's like okay I tried that one and that one doesn't light me up as much as this one does and so I need to let I can pass this stuff on because I'm probably not going to do that again right you can filter for the things that aren't as entertaining as you thought they would be or the messiest the the ones that are the messiest to clean up or or... (laughs) yeah maybe it's not worth it because it's too much of a hassle to clean it right now yeah you can sort of filter for that it sort of sounds like arty antics is still actively doing all of those yes 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 yeah that was what i got suzanne says sadly for me at some point i passed an invisible invisible threshold of buying art supplies which led me to no longer practicing too many choices plus making decisions equals inactivity interesting and that is um you know you're describing a point of overwhelm right um where you're overwhelmed with what how much is there and what it is and how you would use it and yeah like that's that's a good reason to stop and organize the contents into collections and decide is this collection one that i'm still interested in or not because if too much choice is something you find paralyzing then peeling out some of the choices might give you back uh, your ability to be creative again so uh, just like a room that's just chaotic from overuse or from overbuying um, if you are overstimulated by too many choices it's time to remove some choices so that you can get back to having fun because it's, you know, better that you have two crafts that you actually um, get in there and do versus having the option for eight that you find too overwhelming to pick from. And so let's get it back to no shame in, in, you know, pairing it down to the two that you like and that you will actually do. And if you get bored, you can trade them out. If it, I don't want to do this one anymore. I'm going to go st- pick a different second one and send away the stuff that I've been doing and pull in a new one. Like you can rotate it that way over time, but yeah, if, if if you have too many choices and it's shutting you down completely, it's time to get rid of some wholesale choices. Call one of your friends and say, here, here, here's all my stuff related to this craft. I get it out of the house because I can't do anything here. Yeah. Right. I, I actually like, to use constraints as a source of right creative limitations like my my sister um fa- my sisters love to garage sale shop for me or thrift store and um, yeah i'm gonna have to and, talk to them about that <laughs> yeah well, they, they're, it's not a huge volume but, <laughs> but jane gave me some scented colored pencils oh god like oh each god. It's only, you know, I think there are a dozen of them or something like right, that. Right, yeah. And so I sort of enjoyed, one day I said, okay, I'm going to use nothing but the scented colored pencils on a project. Now it's a very, <laughs> very limited range of colors. Right. So I wasn't be, wasn't able to do anything terribly sophisticated, but it was fun to just work within that constraint, you know? Right. Just- I mean, I challenge people a lot to, like like the, the conversation about the necklace that was incomplete. So- you had a creative inspiration and you created this necklace, but you can't finish it. And so now you have introduced a creative constraint that I can't finish it with the beads that I, I don't have enough beads to do the way that I did. So now I need to get creative about how I'm going to fix this and maintain some of what I want. So um, then you have to like get creative around a solution about solving the problem and, you know, being creative around a solution to a creative problem is, is is just as much fun. Like, how can I fix this? What can I do instead and, and make it work? And reducing the choices that you can make and then, and then forcing you to do something creative to problem solve helps you stretch your limits a little bit, right? Like you're learning how to flex and how to, you know, imagine and 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 create in a different way and it's it's a good exercise for 
can I fix this? Can I solve the problem? Can I come up with a creative solution here? And man, you'll be surprised how many times what you come up with is a million times better than where you thought you were going. <laughs> Keeps your brain young. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll give the final comment on this one to Yvonne, who says, I've worked out it would take till I'm 90 to complete all the projects I've got. There you go. Get to work and sister. <laughs> yeah, some stuff to right. do, right? You need to be enjoying all the stuff that you've, the, all of the possibilities you've created for yourself there. 100%. I think, I think it's time for our main topic. Okay. What do you think? I'm good. People who struggle with clutter sometimes get discouraged by how far away and out of reach our goals seem to be. We ask ourselves, will I ever finish? Today, we're going to ponder the question of whether we're ever really finished decluttering and offer tips for setting organizing goals that keep you engaged and motivated. Thank you to Peggy, who suggested as a topic that we consider the question, are we ever finished decluttering? We certainly want to be finished, don't we? <laughs> the bigger the project seems, the more we want to get to the end of it and to relax and declare it complete. That is the dream for sure. The truth is decluttering and organizing your stuff is a circular chore like the laundry. You get a pile of laundry, you get to your wash day and you wash it all. You dry it and fold it and hopefully you go put it up in the closet. Of course, we've had those conversations on other episodes of the, of the Clutter right. Free Weekly where people talk about how that part doesn't get done. But in whether, theory, right? whether you do or don't put laundry away. <laughs> Yeah. Put it all away, right? But in theory, you wash it, you dry it, you fold it, you put it up, and you do that over the course of a day or evening or a day or a day or two. And then as soon as you're complete with that, the next day you start a new laundry pile of dirty clothes. And the same is true for decluttering. You might have a big backlog of stuff that you need to go through to clear out your house um, down to a volume that's manageable. And so you have that backlog of Here's the big project I need to work on. And you tackle that big volume, you plan the project, you schedule the various steps and you work, work, work on it. You get the contents down to a level of stuff that seems that's needed to function in your home and your life. And then you try your best to maintain it at this new level. And in the meantime, your life is still moving on. One of your relatives dies. You move to a new house. The mailman keeps delivering the mail. <laughs> you keep cooking dinner. Uh, you're creating and accumulating more clutter and more excess all the time. And so you need to revisit the house contents again. Hopefully it's a smaller project because you started the review much earlier this time. So the circular chore of decluttering looks like this. You define a project area that needs to be worked, what needs to be gone over, what's accumulating um, new stuff. And you make a plan about how to deal with it. And that includes managing the emotions around dealing with it. If you're going to go dig through a space, it's going to generate a lot of emotions. You work the plan and get your space organized again. And when you look around the house and think, I don't have any problems here. I can take a breath and I can relax. Then you get some reset time. You get to chill out and wait for a little while. <laughs> and then when clutter starts to reappear again, you do your best to manage it right away and ask yourself these questions. Do you need to develop a new habit of putting things away as you use it? Do you need to go through things a second or a third or a fourth time to thin your collections down further so they're manageable in a reasonable time frame? And have you gotten used to living with less stuff around you and so you've changed the set point of what you need in the house? It's time to reduce the volume again to an even smaller collection until you get happy with the answers to those questions. The longer that you focus on organizing and the more often that you reset things, the easier and the faster the chore becomes. Eventually, you get it down to a system that you can do in the best possible time. And when the chore of getting organized feels like how efficiently you can do the laundry, you finished which I say in air quotes, <laughs> because that's the real goal. Can you live your life in your space? Can you have what you need and find it when you need it? And can you reset the house to its organized version in a relatively short period of time? If you can say yes to all three parts of this question, then you can consider yourself done, in my estimation at least. There is no point where you organize everything in the house and then everybody stands still and the house stops moving and 
it never is messy again. <laughs> that only works if you organize it and immediately die. And so <laughs> if you're going to keep on living and keep living in the house, then you're going to keep doing this circular tour over and over again and eventually get it down to a system that you can manage and do in a short period of time. You can find what you want. You can live a happy life in the house. And that's what we're going for. I wanted to put that out there because I think a lot of people start the big reset project, the big, I have this big backlog of stuff that I have to deal with and they start working on it and they get to the end. And then, you know, six weeks later, they realize that there's some more accumulation happening over there. <laughs> and then they get discouraged and angry. It's like, I just finished that. Yeah, well, yeah, you will just finish and then you'll keep on living and there'll be more things to do. And so you kind of have to think of it as a, a rolling target instead of a finite finished we're done thing and aim for can I live with what I have and can I find what I've got and can I reset the house quickly and when those things can happen easily as possible then you can consider yourself coasting <laughs> I guess you're coasting with the chore at that point M said, thanks for your thoughts about pushing the limits, creative thinking to make do. I was toying with the idea of finding three beads about the same size, all of which would have some special significance, then randomly placing them throughout the necklace to complete it. Oh. Now to find the special beads. That sounds like a that sounds like a fun approach. Right, right. And Suzanne responded, I wonder if I could part with some. I she she said she has she has so much that it's it's stopped her mm -hmm. um i definitely could do this since much is unused the only obstacle would be that i could not replace these supplies due to not being able to afford to rebuy especially at today's prices i will definitely do what gail suggested organize these pull out the basics and see if i can get restarted i'm a giver not a seller so it would be so easy to unload mm -hmm. maybe i am at this point in my decluttering journey right go team go because we want you to be able to creative. We want you to be able to do that if that's what's you're, what you're into. Jane says, in the areas already decluttered, one in, one out is my goal. That way, things hopefully won't get out of control again. Because that maintains, that process maintains the, you know, the air space that you created. It, it maintains the ease of in and out as you're putting things away, like in the closet, when you got to go hang the clothes up after the laundry, if you thin the closet down so that it's easy to put the stuff away, then um, taking something out when you put something new in maintains that space and capacity in your closet, which is great. It's a good way to go. And it keeps you from succumbing to expectation creep. You know, you, you, when you get used to, if you get used to the, what the organized space looks like yeah you you don't want that you don't want that to erode you you need you need that you need a way of thinking about it that keeps it at that standard so you don't mm -hmm. develop a develop a new habit of filling filling the space again and it will challenge all of your shopping habits right like when you get the house to a place where you like it you can't keep shopping all the time to buy new stuff to add into the house. Or if you do, you're going to have the project appear to redo the project faster and you're going to still be taking things back out again. So recognizing the level of which you have stuff and need stuff to be replaced will be shifting as you do this work. And the, the need that you have to run around and buy stuff is going to shrink over time. And Get, you got to get okay with that. You got to entertain yourself some other way. <laughs> you, Stop yeah. becoming a consumer. <laughs> yeah, you you may have to shift to using and enjoying the stuff you already have more mm. deliberately. Well, and like she said, if if you buy something new to go in the closet, you got to take something out to go, uh, from the closet to make room for it. And so then your shopping has to be much more considered and less unconscious. You can't be unconscious about it because when you go to the store and come out with a bag of stuff, now it's got to go into your newly organized space without um, crowding something out, without jacking up your systems. And so 
Um, it's important to rehabilitate your shopping to support the way that you've laid out the house as well. Like we've talked about shopping in the kitchen and stuffing the refrigerator and stuffing the pantry without thinking about how fast am I eating through this stuff? How much stuff of this do I already have? Why am I buying more green beans when I already have eight cans of green beans in the pantry? Like you definitely have to rethink how you shop so that that shopping supports your goals in the house of how much you maintain and how dense it is or not dense it is so that you can manage it and and your buying habits impact your environment. Barbara said, when I started organizing financial papers, my husband and I each had multiple accounts with many years of statements. First, I consolidated all the accounts. I kept seven years of statements, but this was still perhaps six different files for prior years. Last year, I finally tossed the last pile of multiple statements. Consolidating, pay, consolidating paid off, and every year I just read the one oldest statement. Oh, good. Good job. So that's, that's a, great. That's a, that's an area that has reached done in right? that. There's, yeah. there's, a regular, there's a regular cyclical uh, maintenance, maintenance task, system. But exactly. That's, but that's all. That's great. That's really great. And it accounts uh, for the fact that you're going to, you're always getting new statements. And if you don't want to be drowning again, you have to have an attrition system on, you know, on the back end. And she's got that working. She's taking the old stuff out one at a time. Connie says, today I began to switch seasonal clothes and it was like shopping from my storage bins. Every Ooh. year, the same sensation. See, you can shop from your own store. <laughs> I say that to my client zero friends all the time. Shop your own store, man. There's plenty of stuff in this house. Just go <laughs> shopping for it, right? Because <laughs> you can't remember everything you own. You cannot possibly remember everything you own. You might remember when you see it again, but if I was to ask you, what do you have in your house? You could not make a full list. So you might as well go shopping in your own store. And I love it. We, um, we, Jaime did a little shopping in our own store in getting uh, Halloween preparations going because, <clears throat> you know, it's, we're deep into September. It's long past time, but we couldn't, <laughs> we put out a bunch of stuff, um, we have some inflatables for the for the kid, you know, for, to entertain the kids and right. uh, and adults, and frighten the dogs, and <laughs> various other pumpkin like objects. Right, right, right. We have some we have some rectangular pumpkins. These are pumpkins by a crafter who really did not try terribly hard. They're just <laughs> rectangular. <laughs> painted orange <laughs> you know but we couldn't find these super cool things that we bought at a craft fair a couple of years ago couldn't he couldn't find them anywhere they weren't with the other stuff and uh we were terrified that maybe you know we're like did could someone have stolen them we do we not notice that they disappeared and uh it turned out he just had not he had packed them away but not not with the other stuff and not, not the way he thought he would have done it. You know what I mean? Right, so, right, right. Like just because you put it in a different kind of bin or bag or box or whatever, it can throw you off. So it's, imp right. it's important to spend that time shopping your collection. And luckily he found the, you know, the nice things from the craft fair that you bought, right? That was, that was the whole point. You had something really cool and you needed to go find it. We so also both good for remembered you. them as much larger than they are. Than they really are. <laughs> they're fairly, they're fairly in small. your they're mind, little, they were much bigger. They're little. Um, they're one. They're ones that are. They're fanciful, scary faces carved with a um, chainsaw. They. Take oh my hunks, goodness! This guy takes hunks of wood and carves them. Carves. You know, he goes like a madman with a chainsaw at them, and then paints. That's paints cool. The result. They're pretty cute. Yeah. That's such a guy craft. Crafting with chainsaw. Right. <laughs> yeah. It involves right. gasoline and mechanics and death threat. <laughs> right. The element of danger. The makes, element of danger in crafting, craft right? More fun, right? <laughs> That's funny. The threat oh of bodily injury. 
<laughs> Linda says, I think of it as trying to maintain a steady state when it comes to the amount of stuff I have in my house. The one in one out mantra really helps to remind me of this. And that's, that's a perfect description of a steady state. You're aiming for a steady state of manageability, right? Of the, the ability to, I can reclaim, I can reset, I can clean up behind myself. I can manage the process of um, feeding myself, clothing myself, bathing. I can make all that happen without a huge detrimental workload right <laughs> and so maintaining something steady and that you can manage easily is that's a good goal okay we may have um created a monster by mentioning the chainsaw catastrophe says omg i did not need that motivation inspiration my my need of a properly functioning chainsaw has suddenly increased drastically <laughs> Okay, no liability from the Clutter Free Weekly. If you can get that chainsaw to do our with, we are not responsible. That's right. <laughs> That's funny. Neither one of us is in any position to be telling people to use power tools. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> That's so funny. They do it with ice sculptures too, right? Like they do the oh, yeah. chainsaw with ice sculpturing. Yeah. Um, in uh, places like Alaska, where it's freezing more than it is here. Suzanne says, craft slash hobby supplies over accumulation is a real problem for so many of us, even for camping, sports, et cetera. It is our, um, you know, default mechanism in this day and age where everything can be had easily and can be supplied easily. And it makes it, it makes the instance between desiring to have and being able to acquire really short. <laughs> and so it, there's not a lot of interrupt time to prevent you from overdoing because we've, our consumer society has created m multiple ways for you to instantaneously get what you need when you have a thought about it, like poof, and you can go get it. And so um, we do have to enter interject our own um judgment shut shut down valves you know like no 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 i don't need to go shopping yes i see that that would be cool but i don't actually have to go get a chainsaw right now like <laughs> it's a good thing to be calm about it and interrupt yourself and i will tell you that when we get on the zoom and we sit together and we bead on crap we do our bead work while we're sitting there chatting on zoom and hardly anybody's shopping during that time. Um, they occasionally will pull out their phone start because we're talking about something and they'll pull out their phone and start buying something that we're talking about. But generally, if we're, if you're working on a project, you have a needle and thread and some beads in your hand, you're not buying things. And so it makes it, it's definitely an interrupter and a distractor, right? If you can get into your craft, you know what it's like to be completely distracted by it and be in the moment with that experience. And so get your friends together, tell them we're not going shopping today. We are going to hang out at my house and we're going to pull all this stuff out and play. Use some and, of my stuff or, or mm, send it home with people. <laughs> yeah. 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 hundred percent. Have the fun. Don't, don't just do the shopping. Ter Teres Marie says I have three mini chainsaws and uh, there's mini chainsaws yeah I don't, and i'm guessing she and she meant to meant to write never use them for the reasons you stated lol oh. why do i have them useful themed idea or something else why store them if i never use them that is right. a good question that's a very good question and um, send them off to some guy that's dying for another power tool oh yeah she meant she, meant to, she definitely meant to say never yeah never never use them she ended up it came in this beer, you know, that darn autocorrect thing. I know, right? <laughs> That's so funny. Um, Naomi says, I don't have a problem shopping too much. I have so much difficulty with making decisions that the vast number of different things available paralyzes me. Ah, uh, right. Like, I, it is very hard to choose from all the options. I wind up wearing worn out socks for months before I actually buy some new socks. 
Well, but then I have you... trouble throwing out the old socks too. <laughs> well, so a good on you that it takes you a long time to buy things or make decisions that's slowing down your consuming. Um, but B you should probably, you know, think of the one in one out rule when you get some new socks, you can say, I've, you know, got my money's worth out of the old socks and it's okay to recycle the old socks. <laughs> you can let them go. It's all right. Okay. I want to talk about next week. We'll be back mm. the usual time. Tuesday, October 3rd at noon U.S. Central Time, live in Zoom and streaming on Facebook. In reviewing um, survey responses, I am, I've been doing this huge project for weeks of trying to go through survey responses, specifically topic suggestions and the ask us anything questions we've asked because we've barely scratched the surface of those. We have a lot more mm -hmm. to go through. Mm -hmm. and, and one thing that came up over and over and over again is lots of people struggle with uh, sentimentality, emotion, memory, and uh, and long-held beliefs associated with their clutter. So we're going to return to that topic next week. We're going to exp explore sentimental clutter and talk about how to balance the the sentimental or emotional value with real-world constraints of time, space, and resources. Right. Watch your email for an invitation to next week's topic. Would you like to give us a tittle? I would love to give you a tittle. This week's tittle is titled Pumpkin Spice Season. It's autumn in the Northern Hemisphere. So this week's assignment is to work on the shift from summer to fall. If you haven't already done so, we're just now sliding into it in Texas. Here are a few ideas to get you started. Handle a project that you avoided during uh, you avoided doing during the summer swelter. For example, decluttering and cleaning an outdoor space like a patio, a deck, the garage, the storage said, I had a client say, um, when it gets cool, then we're going to go out and do the shed. I'm like, yeah, yeah, because we're not doing it now. <laughs> so if you if the, if the temperature has changed for you, you can uh, focus on some of the outdoor spaces. Um, evaluate your summer clothing and accessories now. If you didn't wear or use something this year, this summer season, consider sending it off for donation right now. And then put away anything that you won't need again until next year. But the goal being, don't put away summer clothes that you're never going to wear again. Put away the clothes that you will wear next season and let the rest of them go off as having been uh, reached their, the end of their useful life cycle for you. Inventory, purge, and refresh your pantry and spice cabinet in preparation for the coming cooking season. Fall starts the great... We're going to festivals, we're having parties, we're uh, doing events, and it runs all the way through New Year. So there's a lot of cooking about to start happening. So now is a perfect time to go um, get get clear what's in your pantry, um, get rid of the stuff that you don't want, go find what kind of spices and things related to the seasons that you have right now, and pull them out and see if you're willing to use them or if they need to go in the trash. And, and before you start buying again. So you definitely want to know what's in your pantry before you start shopping for this season. If you started your kid's new school, you're in a panic. <laughs> Take a moment now to establish some order. Designate the drop zones for the backpacks and the school books and the important papers that come home from school and most likely have to turn around and be, you know, like you have to sign them and send them back. And now's the time to make sure that you got drop zones and stations for all that stuff happening that'll survive through the rest of the school year. Now it's also a great time to review and refresh the contents of younger kids' closets because you're going to clear out anything they've outgrown and free up space for the new clothes you got. I'm sure everybody made their whirlwind tour of buying new clothes for the school year. And the question I'm asking is, have you also gone back into that closet and pulled out the things that they can't wear anymore? They've outgrown that they've torn to shreds. <laughs> they've made so dirty, there's no recovering all of those things. It's time to go and do the other half of that chore, which is peel the stuff out of the closet that isn't going to work anymore. Go, uh, you know, contemplate your fall, contemplate your pumpkin spice preferences and uh, do little projects and let us know how it happens. Uh, come and tell us about it next week. Are you familiar with donatestuff.com? I have heard of it, yes. Um C catastrophe recommended it said Houston, this is for houston people if you don't want to go anywhere to donate stuff to charity check oh. out donate stuff.com we'll have to take uh, a look at that do they come and pick up i wonder 
That's what I'm guessing. That's I'm cool. Not, not familiar with it. Or maybe it's a mail-in thing. Donate stuff um, may be a mail-in thing. Maybe so. She also said not sure what areas what areas they cover. Right? We'll yeah, see. but you're right. We need to look that up. We'll look into it. And uh, Thank you for telling us about it. Report. If you're watching this on YouTube, we would love for you to join us live. To get notifications about upcoming events, we invite you to join the meetup group by visiting cfhou.com slash meetup. <clears throat> you can also follow us on Facebook by visiting cfhou.com slash Facebook or join our mailing list by visiting cfhou.com slash subscribe. We love to hear from you, so please keep your questions, comments, and topic suggestions coming on YouTube, Facebook, or anywhere that you find us. You can always reach us through our website at clutterfairhouston.com. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. And I want to say um, I'm sorry. It, it seemed like um, I got some emails from people saying, oh, my God, where are you guys? What happened to the show? So I guess you didn't all get the memo that we were going to be off last week. So my apologies. But joining the email list or joining the meetup group, all of, uh, being on Facebook, all of those are ways for you to get that kind of notification and know, oh, I have to be off for some reason. So um, if you ever wonder what happened to the show, go look at some of our social media channels and see if you can't find a clue there so that you don't panic. <laughs> We, and now, we we won't just disappear forever. And now we're starting, uh, next week starts 12, 12 solid weeks before we take any more off. Right? I Until we that. get to Christmas and then we're off for Christmas again. And then we're off for a while, yeah. Don't forget, we take off a big chunk of time at Christmas time because I have I have to go see family. We have things to do. So um, I we get a little break at the end of the year because Ed and I are fried by the time we get to December. <laughs> so just put that on your calendar. You're just going to have to wait for us there. All right. Thanks for coming, you guys. Great to see you. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.